Chapter 25 New Zombie Below her, the Soviet dropped the white flag. He didn't retreat behind the safety of the ATV as she expected. Instead, he sprang forward like an animal. Amanda tried to shoot him, but he was too fast. He disappeared into the cover of the trees. Her bullets hit bare ground. Above her on the slope, gunfire erupted. Something blurred below her. Her breath caught as the bearded Soviet materialized below her. Their eyes locked. He smiled up at her, revealing bloody teeth. The gray splotches covering his skin weren't like any bruise she had ever seen. Up close, they looked like patches of rot, like zombie rot. She got her first good look at his eyes. They were blood red, even the irises. He looked like a demon. She shrieked as he leaped into the tree, heading straight for her. Swinging her gun around, she fired. Her aim was off. He was too fast. No one should be able to scale a tree that fast. He was like a gorilla on steroids. This wasn't a normal Russian. Just as this thought registered, the soldier burst through the branches and came for her. He hit her just as she fired. They tipped sideways, crashing through the tree. Amanda lost hold of her weapon, screaming as she landed painfully on a branch. It snapped loudly beneath her weight. She kept falling, dropping down through a thick tangle of twigs and leaves. Another branch hit her across the stomach, knocking the wind out of her. She landed face first on the ground, momentarily stunned. The thick tree branch she'd broken was beneath her, digging painfully into her hip. Her gun fell out of the tree. The Soviet was right behind it and still alive. Blood gushed from a wound in his shoulder. Amanda struggled to her knees, her hand closing around the sturdy branch. The Soviet hit the ground no more than five feet away. He rolled onto all fours, baring his teeth at her in a snarl. Amanda finally understood why his beard looked so shiny. It was covered in fresh blood. Droplets of it gathered on the end, flicking through the air as he faced off with her. The Soviet charged. With a squeal of panic, Amanda wrapped both hands around the branch and swung with all her might. There was a loud crack. The branch snapped in half. The Soviet's eyes rolled back in his head. He swayed on his feet. Amanda gripped the broken end of her branch, choking on a sob of fear. Tears ran down her cheeks as she prepared to take another swing. Before she could, the Soviet collapsed at her feet. Was he dead or just unconscious? Just as she grabbed her knife, she saw it, the big dent in his temple where she'd hit him. Blood gushed from the wound, pulling on the leaves beneath the body. Amanda gaped. Had she really hit him that hard? That was a human skull for crying out loud. She got a good look at the branch in her hand. It was a solid three inches in diameter. A girl smaller than her wouldn't have even been able to get a proper grip on it. It sank in. She had killed a Soviet demon with a branch. She, Amanda Nielsen, had delivered a blow powerful enough to smash in the side of his head. Granted, she'd gotten lucky with the blow. The temple was the weakest part of the human skull. But still, what she had done was not normal. Her brain buzzed from a sudden adrenaline crash. Her ears rang. All she could think was, that she should have played softball in high school. Her hands began to shake. She clung to the broken tree branch like a lifeline as she took in the dead Russian. The ringing in her ears subsided. She became aware of voices. There were people coming her way. Amanda, Amanda, where are you? Dal and Lena burst down the slope, running hard in her direction. Amanda! Lena threw her arms around her, crushing her in a hug. 
Dal joined her, the three of them standing in a tight cluster. Amanda dropped her stick and burst into tears, holding on to her friends as though her life depended on it. Her entire body ached from the fall through the tree. She couldn't believe she was still alive. She couldn't believe she hadn't broken anything. Nice work. Lena dried her cheeks with the sleeve of her shirt. Damn, did you do that? Dal knelt down to inspect the crushed skull of the Russian. Or did he hit himself on the way down? I hit him. Amanda gestured to the branch at her feet. Dal's eyebrows nearly climbed off his forehead. Damn, imagine what you could do if you started bench pressing. Amanda decided she was going to start doing just that. And if there wasn't a bench press at the Chikino cabin, which there wasn't, she would do something else. Push-ups, maybe. She'd figure it out as soon as they got home. Maybe she'd get Stevenson to start working out with her. There's something weird about these guys. Dell nudged the dead Russian with his foot. Amanda nodded. They move fast, really fast. I think these gray patches might be zombie rot. And their eyes were all red. And, and I think this guy may have been drinking blood. Same with the ones who attacked us, Lena said. If you hadn't warned us they were coming, they may have gotten a drop on us. They're all dead, right? Amanda needed to hear them say it. We got them, Lena squeezed her elbow. The bastards are all dead. They headed to the nearest of the ATVs. Behind it were the two bodies that had been dragged out of sight. Something had been done to the soldiers. Dal had hit only one of them in the head, but both of the skulls had been cracked open. It didn't take a genius to know parts of the brains had been eaten. Lena turned to the side, gagging. Amanda stared, both horrified and fascinated. The sight of half-eaten brains didn't bother her at all. The pieces clicked together in her mind. The Russian's bloody mouth and beard, his red eyes, the freaky way he had moved. It's a new type of zombie, she whispered. A super soldier. A what? Lena leaned against the side of the ATV, refusing to look at the bodies. A new type of zombie. Look, Amanda pointed. Those soldiers that ambushed us ate the brains of their friends. They moved fast, too, super fast, and they were strong. But they weren't like the other zombies, Dal said. They, you know, had an agenda. Sentient. The word tasted bitter in Amanda's mouth. When Dal and Lena looked at her in confusion, she clarified. They're smart, not like regular zombies or mutants, but they eat brains so they're definitely a type of zombie. That guy back there. She jerked a thumb over her shoulder to indicate the one she had killed. Spoke to us before he attacked. In English. The enormity of this hit them. Amanda put a hand on the ATV to steady herself. She, Dal, and Lena stared at one another. Super soldiers. Never in her life had Amanda been so distressed over being right. These guys are hybrid zombie super soldiers. How? Lena said. Uh, how is that possible? Does it matter? Dal said. If there are more like these guys, we're fucked big time. He scrunched a hand in his hair. We have to get the word out. People have to know what's coming. Chapter 26 Home The ATV hummed below her as Amanda navigated up the steep slope of Pole Mountain. Strapped on the back were all the weapons they'd scavenged from the dead invaders. 
She'd even taken a tissue sample from a dead Russian super zombie. Too bad she had to mix it in the baggie with the other tissue sample, but it was better than nothing. Dal and Lena were on either side of her, each of them on their own ATV. They had decided to take three of them, no telling when the nimble vehicles might come in handy. It was night. The beam of the ATVs cut through the darkness, lighting the way up Pole Mountain. It was the middle of the night. They would have been home sooner if they hadn't come across a mobile trailer in the pasture land. It had been packed with supplies and completely deserted. After gorging themselves on canned baked beans, Oreo cookies, and bottled water, they'd scavenged the extra food and supplies they found. The ATVs were packed. Amanda could almost taste home. She couldn't wait to take a shower. A short one and likely a cold one. Nona didn't like wasting propane to heat the water, but any shower would be welcome no matter the temperature. They rounded a bend, drove up a rise, and at long last the Chiquino cabin came into view. All the windows were dark. The lights of the ATV illuminated the cozy cabin and the front porch. The first thing she saw was a pile of dead mutants off to one side of the clearing. Amanda slammed on the brakes and stopped breathing. She stared at the pile of bodies neatly stacked in the darkness. She hadn't thought mutants could find the Chiquino cabin, or anyone else for that matter. Stevenson, Nona... Amanda tried to call their names, but her throat had stopped working. Holy shit! Dal jumped off his ATV. What happened here? Nona! Nona! Stevenson! Are you here? Nona! Where's Nona? Lena jumped to the ground beside Dal, panic straining her voice. Dal! Where's Nona? I'm here! Nona's voice sounded somewhere from the trees. Amanda nearly collapsed with relief when a second voice chimed in. Lena, Dal, we're here, Stevenson called. The two of them burst from the tree line. Nona had a machine gun in her hands. Though she usually preferred her rifle, seeing the old lady armed wasn't an unusual sight, at least not to Amanda. It was the sight of Stevenson that stunned her to her core. She'd been friends with him since freshman year when he joined the chess club. He did everything with her and Cassie, including the occasional sleepover. He was practically a blood brother. On a scale of one to ten, if someone had asked how well she knew Stevenson, she would have given herself a nine. She hardly recognized the boy who came out of the darkness with Nona. It was Stevenson, no doubt about it. She'd recognize that disheveled, sandy hair and lanky body anywhere. But it wasn't the same boy she'd hugged goodbye two days ago. For starters, he was covered in blood. He looked like he'd been in a wrestling match with a mutant. More than one of them, actually. The fact that he was still alive was a shocker. The guy didn't have an aggressive bone in his body or at least not that she had ever seen. He'd survived the war this long through sheer dumb luck. He must have undergone a transformation. When the chips were down, he'd found the strength to fight for his life. She hadn't thought it possible, but here he was, proof that he'd found the courage to fight, to live. But that wasn't what had her feet welded to the ground in shock. Stevenson, tall and lanky and covered with blood, with a gun in one hand, was dressed like a girl. Part 3. Survivors Chapter 27. Snow Help me, Valet! Luca grabbed her around the waist and dragged her in front of him. Valentina screamed as two snowballs smacked into her, one in the face and one in the chest. Cold powder singed her exposed skin 
and found its way past the collar of her jacket. Luca! she screamed. Her older brother burst out laughing as he released her. Valentina snatched up a handful of snow and flung it after his retreating form, but she didn't have the strength to throw very far. Luca cackled and kept running. Sorry, Valet, I was aiming for Luca. Her cousin Marcello sprinted past her in hot pursuit. Come with me, let's get him. Grinning despite herself, Valentina scooped up another armload of snow. The boys were twelve, and she was only eight, but that didn't stop her from trying to keep up. Her little legs churned through the frozen white in a futile effort to catch them. Marcello was big and fast. He caught up to Luca by the blackberry patch. Luca tried to cut around the patch and dash through Mr. Spada's olive tree orchard, but Marcello grabbed the collar of his coat. He and Luca fell to the ground in a tangle, wrestling with one another in the snow. Luca, a stocky boy and strong for his age, managed to get Marcello on his back. A handful of snow went into Marcello's face. Valentina caught up with the bigger boys. She dashed up behind Luca and dumped her snow down the back of his jacket. Luca bellowed. Valentina shrieked in delight as he wrestled her to the ground and shoved her face into the snow. Marcello joined the fray. The three of them laughed and yelled and flung snow at one another. They raced through the sleepy Italian village like wild dogs, chasing one another and throwing snowballs with tireless abandon. They didn't even notice when the snow started to fall and dusted the tips of their eyelashes. By the time they returned home to supper that night, they were muddy, sopping wet, cold, and full of smiles. It was one of the best days of Valentina's life. Her birth name was Valentina Giulietta Treone. As a girl, she went by valet. As a young woman, she became Valentina Giulietta Cecchino. On that day, Valet ceased to exist. She became Valentina, the name her husband always called her. Today, she was known as Nona. She liked this name most of all. Valet had been a liar, an unfaithful liar who turned her back on family. Valentina had been a coward, a coward and a runaway. But not Nona. Nona was made of stronger stuff. She was everything Valet and Valentina were not. She never let fear dictate the decisions she made. She took care of those she loved, no matter what. She ran a strong household and had raised a damn fine son. In due time, she'd helped raise three fine grandchildren. She'd even killed zombies when they threatened her family. Nona was glad the world had made her strong. Being strong meant she kept a cool head when Anton, her youngest grandson, got it into his mind to sneak away on a hopeless mission to Rossi. She knew what waited for him in Rossi. She held out hope the young idiot would get his head on straight before he blundered and got himself killed or captured. Being strong also meant she didn't weep when her eldest grandson rode away on a mission to blow up a bridge. Nona was no fool. She knew there was a chance she might never see Leo or Anton again. Even though the very idea made her insides clench, she didn't let it show. As she watched Dal drive away in her son's old brown pickup, her granddaughter Lena by his side, she stayed strong. Knowing her grandchildren were dispersing across the county while war boiled around them was not easy to bear. A weaker woman would have wept. Nona didn't waste tears on possibilities. She saved her grief for the times when it really counted. Tears were reserved for moments of finality. Except for Stevenson, who had become her constant companion in the past week, 
The Chikino cabin was now deserted. Stevenson stood beside her on the deck of the family cabin, staring at the empty dirt road after Dal, Lena, and Amanda had disappeared in the brown pickup. The idiot boy was in nothing but jeans and a T-shirt. He shivered in the foggy, crisp morning air, trying to balance on the ball of one bare foot. He went shoeless much of the time while in the cabin. Nona wasn't sure if that was because Cassie had shot off his little toe or if it was because he just liked being barefoot. What are we going to do today? Stevenson asked. Make pasta? We organize the supply room? Nona looked him up and down. He reminded her so much of her brother Luca. It wasn't his looks. Stevenson looked nothing like her stocky, muscular older brother with thick, dark hair. All the village girls had swooned over Luca when he'd been alive. He could have had any of them. Stevenson was long and skinny, more bones than muscle. His hair looked like he combed it with a cheese grater. The boy hid behind her apron strings. He spent his days living in stark terror of himself. And that was precisely why he reminded her of Luca. Today, you're going to learn how to shoot a gun, she declared. Stevenson flinched, eyes widening. But what about lunch and dinner? Who's going to get food ready for everyone? She poked him in the shoulder. Hard. You need to learn how to defend yourself. But... Stevenson cast his gaze around the porch as though he might find a suitable excuse under the eaves or on the picnic table. But everyone else knows how to shoot. We don't really need one more gunman, you know. But food, everyone needs to eat, and... Stevenson? Yes, Nona? My grandson and Tate Craig went to Rossi. Stevenson's brow furrowed with sympathy. I'm sorry, Nona. He didn't understand. Have you thought about what's in Rossi? She asked. Um, Russians, zombies, probably mutants too. That's right. The Russians have the Craigs. Have you thought about why the Russians took them prisoner? They think they have a connection to the snipers, to us. That's right. If Anton and Tate don't watch where they step, they're going to end up prisoners too. Nona was careful not to let it show just how much this potential reality hurt her. Being weak wouldn't do an ounce of good for anyone. If the Russians have four of our people prisoner, it spells bad news for us, Stevenson. The boy was already pale. In the weak dawn light, he went two shades lighter. Do you think Soviets are going to come here? He whispered. Are you ready to learn how to use a gun? She replied. Uh, yeah. Sick realization stole over his features. Yeah, I think I'm ready to learn how to shoot. Go inside and put some shoes on. I'll get the guns. Oh, and Stevenson? Yeah? He paused in the doorway to look back at her. She saw Luca shining out of his dark eyes. It made her throat tighten. You can put on the clothes I left out for you. He froze. I don't know what you're talking about. You can put them on anyway. Nona, I don't know what you're talking about. The kid was a bad liar. She'd seen him out in the living room one night when he thought everyone else had been asleep. He hadn't accounted for the fact that grandmas had weak bladders and had to get up in the middle of the night, multiple times usually, to use the bathroom. He hadn't noticed when Nona had shuffled out to use the facility. He'd been too busy staring at his reflection in the window. Luca had been a poor liar, too. Chapter 28 Pink 
Stevenson tried not to throw up all over his shoes as he put them on. His nerves felt fried just thinking about guns. Did Nona really think he had what it took to wield one? What did he look like? Rambo? The other guys had the gun thing covered. Any one of them could pass for Rambo in a pinch. Heck, with their machine guns and badass moves, they were like an entire band of Rambos. Leo, Anton, Dal, Tate, Spill, Griggs, and Bruce. Heck, even Jennifer and Lena made better Rambos than he did. As he bent down to grab his second sneaker, he glimpsed the neat pile of clothing tucked under the bottom bunk. The pile he had surreptitiously shoved all the way to the back and hidden behind his shoes. There were the Jordache jeans with zippers at the back of the ankles, the black mesh top and the pink spaghetti strap tank top, the matching pink Converse shoes. The worst part was that it was all a perfect fit. It had only been a week ago when he saw Nona go into the boys' bunk room with the clothes. From his position at the kitchen table, where he'd been hard at work picking stems out of a colander of dried lentils, he'd had a clear view of her with the neat stack of clothing in her hands. It was the pink spaghetti straps that caught his attention. Pink had that effect on him. It was impossible not to see pink things. Scrunchies, socks, shoes... There had been a lot of pink all over his high school. He'd assumed Nona had been on her way into the girls' room with the clothes. Her stop in the boys' room was just a detour. But she came back out of the room without the clothes and looked straight at him. Your bunk is a mess, she'd said as she strode back into the kitchen. Go clean it. What? He paused hand in midair over the lentils with a stem pinched between his thumb and forefinger. Nona had her head in the spice cabinet. Your bunk is a mess. What are you talking about? I made the bed this morning. Nona sniffed. Kids these days, they don't know the meaning of the word clean. Go, now. Stevenson tossed the stem onto a plate with other discarded stems. Okay, Nona. He rolled his eyes behind her back. He was good at making the bed. His mom, who spent a few summers in college cleaning hotel rooms, was an expert. She taught Stevenson everything he knew about making beds. He knew for a fact that his bunk looked better than all the others. But he went to the room anyway. A person didn't have to spend more than five minutes in the Chikino cabin to figure out that you did what Nona said. Period. When Stevenson confronted his perfectly made bed, he found himself face to face with the pink spaghetti strap tank top. It sat in the middle of his bunk like an invitation. It was an invitation both dreaded and yearned for. It wasn't just the tank. There was a perfect black mesh shirt that went over the top. An adorable pair of stonewashed jeans with zippered ankles sat next to the shirts. And the shoes. Pink Converse. They were slightly worn and scuffed around the soles. It was the sort of thing any girl would die for. Stevenson wasn't sure if he wanted to caress them or set them on fire. He did neither. He shoved them under the bed as fast as he could and returned to the kitchen. He tried to disappear into the colander of lentils. Nona came into the cabin with a handful of fresh bay leaves. He avoided her eye, fearful of what she might say to him. But all she said was, Wash these when you're done with the lentils. Feet clad in perfectly boring and atrociously masculine footwear, Stevenson trudged into the cabin's sitting area. He hated the way his missing toe felt inside his shoe. It was easier to forget it was gone when he was barefoot. But Nona had told him to put on shoes. Besides, he was pretty sure he needed shoes to learn how to shoot a gun. Nona stood in the kitchen. On the table 
were two guns he hadn't seen before. Not that Stevenson was any sort of weapons expert. He wasn't like Leo and Dal and Danton. Those guys had practically been born with guns in their hands. But there was a weapons rack by the door. It was actually just two old orchard pallets turned on their sides, but that's where everyone stashed their weapons between missions. There was a clear line of sight between the weapons rack and the kitchen table where Stevenson spent most of his days prepping food for the snipers. In that time, he'd spent enough time looking at the weapons to know which ones belonged to whom. He learned to recognize them by sight. He also spent his fair share of time down in the storage room below the cabin. Along with their food stores, weapons acquired on missions were stored there. Stevenson had spent enough time in the storage room to know the difference between a machine gun, a rifle, and a handgun. The two guns Nona had on the table weren't like anything he'd seen before. They were sort of like handguns, but the barrels were much longer. Where did those come from? he asked. Nona smiled. So, you have been paying attention. Stevenson shrugged. Kind of hard not to notice when there are guns in my face all day long. So, what are these things? These, Nona tapped the long barrel of the guns, are silencers. He blinked. Silencers? Yep. We don't have a car, and I don't know how to ride a bike. I'm too old to walk ten miles to an isolated place to shoot. So, we use silencers. What about the horse? The stocky old mare Lena had brought from Rossi Junior College was the last of their horses. Nona snorted. I'm too old to ride a horse. That was fine by Stevenson. He didn't like horses at all. Considering the fact that they were plant eaters, their teeth were way too big, in his opinion. He was terrified of being bitten. Where did you get silencers? He felt stupid as soon as the question left his mouth. This little old woman was the person who had an anarchist cookbook, fuse wire, and a basement full of ingredients to make explosive devices. Why was he surprised she had silencers? I believe in being prepared. My son helped me get these from a dealer back east. Aren't they nice? Her wrinkled hand caressed the length of the barrel. Well, yeah, but what are you planning to do with them? Young man, Nona pinned him with her dark eyes. I survived Mussolini, Hitler, and Nazis. One can never be too prepared. This war is evidence of that. Oh, Stevenson felt like an idiot. She was right, of course. Pick one, Nona said. He eyed the two weapons. They looked identical. Both were equally unappealing. You know, there's an excessive amount of masculine energy in this house already. Stevenson said. There are plenty of people who know how to use weapons. Can't... You can't leave your life in the hands of anyone else, Nona said. Did you forget the conversation we just had outside on the porch? Well, yes. Stevenson had neatly locked that away. The idea of the Russians getting their hands on Tate and Anton and torturing the location of the cabin out of them made him want to curl up in a tiny ball and disappear. Truth be told, if he had to pick between learning how to handle a gun and picking stems out of lentils, he'd rather pick stems out of lentils until his fingers bled. He delicately picked up the gun that was closest to him. Nona nodded at him in approval. Let's go. She shoved her gun into the deep pocket of her apron. On the way out the door, she scooped up a handful of cartridges and dropped them into her other apron pocket. He was hanging out with one badass grandma. Stevenson admired her almost as much as he was intimidated by her.
Chapter 29 Practice Valet, help me. Snow. So much snow. It gathered on the tops of her ears. It burned the tip of her nose. Tiny flakes melted on her cheeks, dripping across her skin like tears. Snow swirled around her boots, swiftly camouflaging the dark brown leather against the chilly white. Fourteen-year-old Valentina was as frozen on the inside as she was on the outside. More flakes swept down, melting in the pool of blood that marred the perfect snow in front of her. It was so fresh, it still steamed in the cold. As far as puddles went, it wasn't very large, maybe fifteen centimeters across at most. It was lopsided. The right side was thin and tapered to a point. The left side was large and wide. That's where the blood first landed, Valentina thought. Not too far from the pool was a footprint. A bloody footprint that was already partially concealed with white flakes. The back part of the print was a crisp imprint in the snow. The front part was smeared, bits of red dragged across it. Valentina stood in the freezing cold, her eyes moving to a second bloody footprint, and then to the third, then to a fourth, a fifth, and so on, until the prints disappeared around the back side of the shed. Even though it was full dark and snow made the air white all around her, the blood stood out like a beacon. Her mind was frozen, but her eyes worked. Her gaze kept moving from the lopsided pool across the footprints and back again. Valet, help me. Nona led Stevenson through the early morning hiking west along one of the many hunting footpaths that dotted the Chiquino property. The fog already dissipated, promising a hot summer day. Stevenson flailed along in her wake. Even though they were on a path, it sounded like he blundered into every bush and tree that bordered the trail. His awkwardness made her heart ache. She was determined to do her best to make sure he lived through the storm that was coming. Because there was a storm coming. Nona didn't know what it looked like or what shape it would take, but she knew as surely as she knew her own name that something bad was on its way. It was just like that day her brother had died. It was the day he'd come home with his partisan patch sewn to his sweater so full of pride that he joined the resistance army to protect their country from fascists. His smile had been big enough to crack the sun in half. His radiance had nearly blinded her. As he stood in their family living room, so full of life and optimism, all she had felt was dread. It was a weight on her shoulders, so heavy it threatened to push her into the earth. It was a stomach that wanted to empty itself of the fear that had taken up residence there. Nona strode through the woods with Stevenson on her heels, feeling that same sense of foreboding settle on her. Even after forty years, she had not forgotten what tragedy felt like. Tragedy always sent heralds ahead of its arrival, if you knew how to look for them. It was the same on the day her son had died. Even before Dal and Lena had returned home and delivered the news, she had known. At the thought of her dead son, Nona felt her throat constrict. She missed her boy more than she could ever say. But he'd died a hero. He'd saved his children, both Lena and Dal. It was as it should have been. Nona would have expected no less from her boy. She tried not to overthink the heavy feeling of oncoming tragedy or to overanalyze it. Knowing something was coming wasn't the same as knowing what was coming. In some ways, the foreboding was the worst of it. Whatever it was, 
she was going to make sure Stevenson had the skills to survive. She would help him as much as she could. For Luca. For Luca, she would lay down her own life to keep Stevenson alive. Chapter 30 Princess of Power Stevenson trudged along behind Nona. Every step he took convinced him that, when all this madness was over, he was moving to a place with lots of concrete. Lots and lots of concrete. If he never walked through another forest in his life, it would be too soon. There were bugs and spiders and cobwebs out here. And other stuff. Raccoons and skunks and stuff. God, and squirrels. As far as Stevenson was concerned, squirrels were the spawn of demons. For one thing, they were basically really big mice with fluffy tails. Everyone else thought they were cute, but Stevenson wasn't fooled by their supposed cuteness. Three of them lived in the two big mulberry trees in his backyard. The little bastards tormented the family dogs and quarreled with one another all hours of the night. Once... He'd even seen a squirrel throw an acorn at their cat. He was so busy watching the trees for demonic squirrels that he kept running into trees and bushes. He even blundered into a few cobwebs on the side of the trail. If he thought a gun would be a decent defense against a cobweb, he would have asked to learn how to shoot a long time ago. It felt like Nona dragged him through the woods for hours. In reality... It probably was no more than 45 minutes. Finally, she led him off the trail into a shallow valley of land. It was perhaps 50 yards across and surrounded by towering oak trees that most people would have called majestic. Stevenson called them home to ticks. Thank God the branches didn't extend over the whole clearing. If he stood near the center... He was pretty sure it would be near impossible for a tick to drop onto his head. On the far side of the clearing was a half-rotted tree. It looked like it had fallen over a thousand years ago. It was probably home to termites and thousands of other creepy, crawly things. Nona marched over to the log and pulled out her knife. It was a big hunting blade like all the boys wore. Even Amanda and Cassie wore big knives like the boys. Nona pressed the tip of the knife into the rotting tree bark. The wood flaked off easily under the pressure of the blade. She drew three concentric circles in the bark, finishing it off with a bullseye in the middle. Apparently, that old dead tree was going to be used for target practice. Stevenson tried not to imagine bugs discharging from the wood, every time a bullet sank in. He adjusted his glasses. Just to the right of where he stood was an old carving in the side of the tree. It was partially overgrown with moss, but he clearly made out the shape of a heart. It was lopsided. Whoever had drawn it hadn't been deft at carving. In the heart was a set of initials. G.C. plus V.C. How did you know about this place? He traced the letters with his eyes, noting how the bottoms were mostly filled with lichen. My husband used to bring me here for picnics. That's neat. What was his name? Giuseppe Cicchino. God rest his soul. Nona glanced up at the trees. He imagined her looking up at her late husband through those branches. Now, she came to stand beside him, fishing her gun out of her apron. Time to practice. Let's start with the basics. She looked at him, clearly waiting for him to hold his weapon. Stevenson reluctantly pulled the gun out of his belt. Nona walked him through the anatomy of the weapon, showing him the basics. He tried to pay attention, but he was too busy thinking about the likelihood of shooting off a second toe. Any questions? Nona asked. He wanted to ask when they were going to go home, but didn't. No, Nona. Good. Now I want you to practice shooting. 
Try to hit the target I made for you. This is the part he'd been dreading. He attempted to give himself a pep talk. If little old Nona could kill zombies, so could he. If little old Nona could hold a rifle like a gunslinger straight out of a Western movie, he could find the courage to pull the trigger. The first shot missed the tree by at least three feet. The gun was surprisingly loud, considering it had a silencer. You flinched, Nona frowned at him. Don't flinch. Why is it so loud? It's not loud. It has a silencer. Yeah, but aren't silencers supposed to be, you know, silent? Only in the movies. Well, at least they were out here in the middle of nowhere. There was very little chance of attracting mutant zombies way out here, even if the guns were louder than he expected. Stevenson spent the next hour making an ass out of himself. Even with Nona's instruction, he couldn't hit the rotted trunk. He blew through three magazines. Nona sat off to one side, reloading bullets into the used magazines. Are you sure we should keep doing this? he asked. Did you have other plans today? I just don't want to, you know, waste bullets. Nothing is being wasted if you learn how to shoot and protect yourself. She gave him a sharp look from where she sat on a log, a box of bullets balanced on one knee as she loaded the magazine. You aren't dying on my watch, Jeff Stevenson. You're going to learn to hit something with a gun, or I'll shoot you myself and spare you the agony of getting captured by a Russian. Her words chilled him. You really think Russians are going to come here? She gave him a flat look. Keep practicing. We're not leaving here until you can hit that target consistently. I need to know you can take care of yourself. He wasn't sure why she bothered with him. Everyone knew he was alive only through sheer dumb luck. If Leo and Dal hadn't rescued them from Cassie's house, he would have died there. The Chiquinos had taken him in. He did his part, sure, but he was here only by their grace and kind hearts. It was clear from the look on Nona's face that she meant what she said. They were going to stay here until he learned how to shoot. Stevenson closed his eyes, taking a moment to gather his resolve. He wasn't cut out for this stuff. Nona was in denial, thinking she could mold him into a real sniper. Still, he'd spent enough time with her in the past week to know she didn't mince words. If she said they were going to stay out here until he learned how to shoot, he would be old and gray by the time she allowed him to go back to the cabin, unless he could suck it up and actually start hitting the target. Licking his lips in concentration, he raised the gun and fired a few more times. All he managed to do was make the bushes rattle. He still missed the damn tree every time. The image of his little sister, Gabby, flashed through his mind. He had a clear memory of her jumping out of a closet with her cape and plastic sword, ambushing him with a triumphant cry. Got you! she had screamed, pointing her plastic sword at his heart. I am she the princess of power, and you are the evil Hordak. Die, Hordak! Stevenson had effected a dramatic death while Gabby stood over him like the shining little princess she was. Gosh, he missed her. Most days, he tried not to think of her. She'd been on a field trip to San Francisco when the Soviets invaded. It was easier not to think of her. Imagining what might have happened to her and her little classmates made him sick. Gabby had a lot of toys, but she had always been his favorite. Stevenson secretly liked how the imaginary princess could draw a sword and magically transform into a fierce warrior. If only it was so easy to transform into an apocalyptic badass. I need a magic sword, he muttered. 
he thought of the perfect pair of pink Converse back at the house. It was terrible that he wanted to wear them. He knew that. He could only imagine what all the junks would say if they came home and saw the skinny nerd in pink Converse. A bullet flew from the barrel of his gun. Nona jumped up from her stump, grinning at him. You did it! I knew you had it in you! I did? Stevenson gaped at the tree trunk. Are you sure? He'd been distracted, thinking about those stupid hot pink converse. Come look, Nona said. Stevenson followed her across the clearing. A rush of pride went through him when she showed him the bullet buried in the rotted wood of the tree stump. I did it. He could hardly believe it. Whatever you were doing, do it again, Nona ordered. Keep practicing until you can hit the tree every time. Do it again? He'd been too busy thinking about Shira, his sister, and the pink converse. Between all that, he hadn't been paying attention to what he was doing with the gun. He returned to his shooting position. Four more shots, and he missed the log every single time. Nona frowned at him, clearly disapproving. Be Shira, he told himself. Draw your magic sword. Once again, he thought of the pink shoes. Imagining them on his feet in place of his ugly sneakers was a visceral experience. He could practically feel the way they would hug his feet. His next shot hit the log. Nona jumped to her feet, clapping her hands. You're getting the hang of it. Keep going. Oh, God. It was the pink converse. They were his magic sword. His ticket to being She-Ra. Before She-Ra had become the Princess of Power, her name had been Aurora. Aurora had been kidnapped and raised by Hordak, the very enemy she later fought to defeat. But as the child Aurora, she'd been brainwashed to think she was a part of Hordak's evil horde. A shiver traveled down his spine. A very deep part of him had always felt like Aurora. Like he didn't belong in the horde he had been born into. There was a warrior princess within him, but letting her out was scarier than dying. It was a secret he buried so deep it practically suffocated him. He'd carried it for as long as he could remember. In the secret space of his heart, he'd often wondered if his true body had been hijacked before he'd been born. Most days, it felt like Jeff Stevenson's body should have belonged to someone else. There was another body out there that should have been his, a girl's body. We're burning daylight, Nona said. Keep practicing. Screw it. No one had to know. He just had to shoot well enough to satisfy Nona. Then they could go home. He imagined burning his god-awful ugly tennis shoes and slipping on those pink converse. He imagined tying the white laces into perfect bows. They would fit his feet perfectly, like Cinderella slipping on her glass slippers. Another shiver traveled down his spine. He clung to that feeling as he fired again. The bullet hit. He set his jaw, hanging onto the imagined embrace of those pink shoes. The next ten bullets sank into the tree. Nona applauded him. It felt so good to see her beaming. What would it be like if he really wore those shoes? Maybe he could be a real sniper if he was brave enough to wear them in real life. Now, Nona said, I want you to practice hitting the inside of the target. Can we go home if I hit it? If you can hit it twenty times, yes, we can go home. Twenty times? She really was trying to make him into a Rambo. He mentally burned his ugly green polo shirt and put on the hot pink spaghetti strap tank, holding that image of himself 
holding how those clothes made him feel, he fired. Seven of the next ten bullets hit Nona's target. By the time the sun was high in the sky, Stevenson could honestly say he didn't completely suck at shooting things. After Nona was confident he could hit a target standing still, she made him practice shooting while walking in wide arcs around the target. Once she was confident he could do that, she made him do it at a jog. Nona let him take a short break for lunch. Unbeknownst to him, she had packed little baggies with food. One had dried apple chips. The other had dried venison. He wolfed it all down, barely tasting any of it. He looked around for something to drink, wondering if she would make him drink out of the spring on the edge of the clearing. Then he wondered what it would be like if he got dysentery or some other horrible waterborne bacteria. Like a magician, Nona pulled a wide, flat canteen out of her apron pocket. Wordlessly, she passed it to Stevenson. He decided Nona's apron was better than Santa Claus's magic sack of presents. He was parched. Taking the proffered canteen, he tossed back his head. What hit his tongue wasn't water. It was something else, something that burned the inside of his throat like lava. Stevenson gagged, trying to spit it out. Beside him, Nona wheezed with laughter. <coughs> what, what the heck was that? he demanded. <laughs> Whiskey. Nona gave him a sly smile. The boys don't know it, but I keep a bottle stashed under the sink behind the garbage bags. Figured it was high time you learned how to take a little fire in your belly. <laughs> what? Why? he sputtered. She patted him on the shoulder. Sometimes in life you have to swallow a little fire. That sounds painful. Well, was it? <laughs> yeah. Stevenson coughed a few more times to emphasize the point. She patted him on the back. Her smile was kind, but she followed it up by saying, Lunch break is over. Time to get back to practice. Unless you want another swallow of whiskey. He eyed the canteen, thinking of all the bigger, older boys who lived in the cabin. Do you think I should? Nona squinted at him before shaking her head. Maybe later, when you aren't practicing with a gun. After that, they practiced loading and unloading magazines with bullets. They practiced racking and clicking the safety on and off. This was followed by yet more target practice. Finally, when Stevenson thought he might faint from exhaustion, Nona called an end to the practice. They had been out here for no less than six hours. Stevenson had the beginnings of a blister on his index finger. It was a long slog back to the cabin. He fully expected Amanda and the others to be home when they got there. She would not believe that he... Jeff Stevenson had spent the entire day shooting a gun. He couldn't wait to tell her about the whiskey. He was pretty sure Amanda had never tasted alcohol before. To his surprise, the hard-packed clearing in front of the cabin was empty. He and Nona stopped on the edge of the clearing, both of them staring at the space where Mr. Chikino's beat-up brown pickup should have been. Anxiety knotted in Stevenson's gut. Amanda, Dal, and Lena should have been back hours ago. Something happened, Stevenson whispered. His mind spun with all the horrible scenarios that could have befallen Amanda and the others. Zombies, Russians, rabid dogs, flat tire. Nona's mouth tightened. Without a word, she marched toward the cabin. Nona? Stevenson hurried after her. Where do you think they are? She kept walking, her steps light on the wooden stairs leading up to the porch. Nona? Nona, where? She stopped in the doorway. Stevenson almost crashed into her. 
Nona turned around to face him, whiskey canteen in one hand. I don't know where they are, Stevenson. Her lips were in a hard line. Something happened, or they would have been home by now. She poked him in the chest with an index finger. We do not cry over possibilities in this house. We are going to go inside and make dinner. No tears. Understand? Stevenson, pinned by her dark eyes, nodded. Good. She opened the canteen and took a long drink. Put a little fire in your belly, boy. She shoved the canteen into his hands before spinning on her heel and disappearing into the house. Chapter 31 The Boy with the Painted Face She dreamed of Nazis chasing her through Mr. Spada's orchard. Just as the Nazis cornered her at the back of Mr. Spada's barn, 14-year-old Valentina bolted upright in her bed. Luca? she whispered. Silence greeted her. Luca? She squinted as her eyes adjusted, searching for her brother. A lumpy wad of yellow-flowered quilt was the only thing that greeted her. Her heart still pounded with fear in her chest. Where was Luca? Valentina wrapped her blanket around her shoulders, licking dry lips as fear shivered through her. She ran her fingers over the canvas backpack she kept under her bed. The entire family had a backpack, each one filled with supplies in case they needed to make a run for it. Partisan sentiment was strong among the villagers. Everyone knew Mussolini and his Nazi friends could sweep through here with soldiers at any time. Her backpack had one change of clothes, a canteen of water, a small package of nuts, dried meat, and cheese. She always kept her shoes right next to the backpack, just in case she needed to flee in the middle of the night. Where was Luca? She crept out of the bedroom she shared with her big brother, holding the blanket around her shoulders like a cape. The yellow-flowered quilt was an exact match to the one on Luca's bed. Their grandmother had made the blankets for them. The house was silent. The door to her parents' room was closed. The gap between the door and the floor was dark, telling Valentina they were indeed asleep. She heard a soft sound in the living room. Poking her head around the corner, she spotted the dark hair of her brother. A single oil lamp burned on the end table next to the sofa. Luca knelt on the floor in front of the lamp. He was hunched over his back to Valentina. The sight of him filled her with relief. He was probably up reading. He did that sometimes when he couldn't sleep. Their father prided himself in the family's collection of books, which sat in a proud row on top of the fireplace hearth. She padded over the cold wooden floor, beelining in his direction. Maybe he would read to her. She loved it when he did that, even though he was just as apt to tell her to go back to bed. Luca, will you? He jumped in surprise at her approach, spinning around. Valentina froze. Even though the light in the room was dim, her eyes were well adjusted. Not even the gloom could hide her brother's face. His lips were painted a bright red. Pink rouge colored his cheeks. Dark coal lined his eyes. Resting in his fingertips were their mother's brushes and rouge pots. Shock reverberated between brother and sister. Valentina's mouth hung open, words clogging up her throat. The horrified look on Luca's face said more than words ever could. The clock on the wall ticked loudly. It filled the silence between Valentina and Luca like bolts of thunder. He moved first. Fists closing around the brushes and tiny rouge jars, he turned his back on her. Go back to bed, Valet. You shouldn't be up at this hour. I... I had a bad dream, she sputtered. 
Isn't Mama always telling you not to be afraid? You can't jump at every little sound like a, a scaredy mouse. The adults will tell us if we need to be afraid. I... I thought maybe you would read to me. Does it look like I'm reading, Valet? He most definitely wasn't reading. Her mind struggled to reconcile what she had seen him doing. It was a new world view she could hardly comprehend. Go back to bed. But what are you doing? I said, go back to bed. At the severity in his voice, she bolted back into their bedroom and buried herself underneath the covers. She couldn't sleep. Luca's voice echoed like gunfire in her mind. Does it look like I'm reading, Valet? I said, go back to bed. She stared into the dark, seeing Luca's face. The painted red lips, the eyes lined with coal, the bright pink cheeks. None of it matched the boy who had once used her as a human shield against snowballs. She heard the sound of water splashing in the kitchen. A few minutes later, Luca came back into their bedroom. She sat up. Luca? You didn't see anything, Valet. Understand? You didn't see anything. Eyes wide, she shook her head. It wasn't the severity of his tone that scared her. It was the fear she saw in his eyes. Even in the muffled darkness of their bedroom, she saw the naked terror in them. I didn't see anything, she whispered. His shoulders sagged with relief. Up until that moment, she hadn't detected the tension. He sat next to her on the bed and took her hand. I'm sorry I frightened you. It's okay. She snuggled up next to him, desperate for reassurance. He put an arm around her shoulders and drew her close. She pressed her face into his side. I had a nightmare. I dreamed the Nazis were chasing me. He stroked her back. I won't let anything happen to you. What really scared her even more than the nightmare was the memory of the boy with the painted face. It had been like looking at a stranger. It wasn't the Luca she knew. Valentina gripped his shirt and hung on for dear life. Valet. Luca placed a hand under her chin and forced her to look up. His face had been scrubbed clean. The boy she knew and adored looked back at her. But did she really know him? She searched his eyes. His eyelashes were still wet. Beyond those long, dark lashes, she saw the scared boy she'd seen in the living room. The boy with the painted face. Vale, you won't tell anyone, will you? The question sat between them like a monster. It terrified her. Valentina shook her head. I won't tell, Luca. Brother and sister clung to each other in the cold darkness. I'm not like other boys in the village, Vale. She didn't ask him to elaborate. There was no need. She was pretty sure other boys in the village didn't get into their mother's rouge and paint their faces in the middle of the night. Boys didn't paint their faces. Even though he spoke no words, she could feel the turmoil roiling off his body. She squeezed him, searching for something comforting to say. I don't care if you like the other boys. I love you no matter what, Luca. A loud exhale rattled through his body. I've always known I was different, he whispered. I... I think God put me into the wrong body when I was born. I think I was supposed to be born... a girl. Her mouth went dry. Her brain struggled to digest this. God didn't make mistakes. Everyone knew that. How could Luca have been born in the wrong body? 
What did he mean when he said he was supposed to have been born a girl? I've never felt like myself, he said. I don't feel right in a man's body. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? She had no idea what he was trying to say, but she responded to the desperation in his voice. Yes, Luca. I knew you'd understand. His hug crushed the breath out of her. I knew my valet would understand. You don't know what it's like to be me. It's so lonely. I'm lonely, valet. She responded to the naked pain in his voice. You're not alone, Luca. You have me. You always have me. I know. He kissed her head. God may have messed up when he put me in this body, but he didn't mess up when he made you my sister. I don't think God can make mistakes. This truth had been drilled into her. Luca's laugh was hollow. <laughs> if I'm not a mistake, then God truly is a bastard. I could forgive a mistake. I can't forgive a cruel joke. He thought his life was a cruel joke? Valentina searched frantically for a response, but she was so confused. Why did Luca think he'd been born into the wrong body? How could God make a mistake? What? What are you going to do? It was the only thing she could think to say. Did he plan to wear women's rouge in the middle of the night for the rest of his life? What would happen when he got married? I'd turn eighteen in six months, he said. I'm going to join the partisans. No! She jerked away from him, staring at him in horror. Luca, no! Il Duce and his Nazis! Luca shook his head. I need to figure out how to be a man, Valet. I don't feel like a man. But he was a man, or almost a man at any rate. You could have any of the village girls, Adelina or Daniela or Francesca or... I know, but I don't want any of them. Luca sighed loudly, scrubbing a hand through his dark hair. I don't know what I want. That's why I'm going to join the partisans and fight for Italy. He gave her a sad smile. Maybe fighting El Duce and his Nazi bastards will make a man out of me. Nona lay wide awake in her bed, staring up at the pattern of the whirls and knot holes on the wooden bunk above her. It was like trying to see through the impenetrable snow of her youth. Tears leaked, slowly and silently and steadily, out of her eyes. She missed Luca every day of her life. She feared for Dal, Lena, and Amanda. She feared they'd been swallowed up by the world, much like Luca had been swallowed. One minute he'd been beside her. The next, all that remained of him were bloody footprints. Chapter 32 Shoes Stevenson couldn't sleep. Mental pictures plagued him. He kept seeing Amanda getting her head smashed open by a mutant. Then he saw her getting shot by a Russian. Even worse was picturing her getting attacked by a mutant and a Russian at the same time. There were also one or two appalling imaginings of Amanda getting attacked by zombified squirrels. It was like watching a horror movie on steroids. As he lay alone in the darkness of the boys' bunk room, he understood why Nona said not to cry over possibility. A person could go insane with possibility. The next time Amanda went out on a broadcast, he would go with her. He'd go and watch her back like he should have done this time. Now that Nona had taught him how to handle a gun... He could help. 
he couldn't shake the memory of what it felt like to finally hit that stupid log. The shoes and clothes under his bunk felt like a raging bonfire beneath him. It was stupid, of course. The clothes weren't on fire. But their very presence was like a persistent fly buzzing around his head. He got up, pacing back and forth across the tiny room. It was eerie being alone in it. He was used to it stinking from all the big guys. Their snoring, while unpleasant, was less oppressive than the silence. Why had Nona given him those clothes? It didn't make any sense. Somehow, she'd guessed his darkest secret. He didn't know how she'd done it. She'd barely known him a week, yet somehow she knew him better than his own parents and his best friends. It was easy to ignore his secret when it wasn't staring him in the face. But Nona had made sure it was front and center. He couldn't stand the torment any longer. It was easier to ignore the pink shoes and girls' clothing when all the other guys were around. They provided a barrier, a shield to hide behind. But when left alone with them, there was no place to hide. His body moved all on its own. He got to his knees and pulled out the clothing. Crushing them to his chest, he curled his body around them. Emotion vibrated within him. He crushed it down, terrified of what might happen if he let it loose. His fingers dug into the fabric. He wasn't sure if they were a lifeline or an anchor that would drag him into the abyss. Where had Nona gotten these things anyway? A feeling overcame him. It was the memory of how he had felt in the clearing when he hit that stupid target on the tree. No, that was inaccurate. He didn't give a crap about hitting the tree. It was the feeling he had imagined of how it would feel for his feet to finally be in the right shoes. What it would feel like to finally draw the sword of protection and transform. He wanted to feel it again, more than anything. she never looked scared. Granted, she was a stupid cartoon character for little girls like Gabby, but still. The point was, transformation never felt scary when seen in a cartoon. Drawing the sword of protection in real life was fucking terrifying. But Stevenson yearned to touch that feeling again. To feel like himself. Not giving himself a chance to think about it any longer, he shucked out of his sleeping clothes. They were flannel pants and a matching shirt Anton had lent him. They were much too big on him. Anton was both taller and wider. Stevenson used a safety pin to hold the pants on. Fumbling with the safety pin, he let the pants puddle onto the ground. He dragged the shirt off over his head, not bothering with the buttons. Buttons would take too long. Stevenson didn't want to wait any longer. In nothing but his underwear, he picked up the clothing from Nona. He shivered in something close to ecstasy as he pulled on the pink tank. It felt like coming home. It felt like finally finding the path to light after a lifetime of wandering around in the dark. The cute black mesh top dropped down over the pink spaghetti straps. The Jordache jeans slid up his legs. A sigh of relief rattled out of his throat as he buttoned them around his waist. Unlike the flannel pants he'd borrowed from Anton, these fit perfectly, like they had been made for him. No, like he had been made for them. Last of all, he slipped his feet into the pink converse. Was this what Dorothy had felt like when she put on her ruby slippers? Is this what it felt like to finally find your ticket home? Stevenson stood in the darkness, clad in girls' clothing. Joy 
coursed through him. He hugged himself, savoring the preciously rare feeling of being at home in his own body. It was a feeling he had been chasing for his entire life. He'd worn the clothes only one time before, when everyone had been asleep. He'd snuck into the living room and put them on. The terror of getting caught hadn't been stronger than the pull of the clothing. He hunched in the center of the room, hugging himself. What did this mean? How could he go through life like this? Some days, he secretly believed it would be easier to be bitten by a zombie or shot by a Russian. Death had to be easier than this reality. Stevenson sat on the floor. Pulling his knees up to his chest, he cried. He cried tears of confusion, tears of relief, and tears of fear.